In this video, I'm going to show you around the only remaining X-15 on display anywhere in the world. I'll tell you about the ground-breaking engine, why it's painted pink, and what the cockpit looks like, and more. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes and some music. And some more music. This includes guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums and reviews of flights from around the world. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. Let's begin with some background information. This was a hypersonic, rocket-powered airplane flown by NASA and the US Air Force during their high-speed research program. Some of the lessons learned on this went on to be used in the Space Shuttle Orbiter and many other aircraft. North American Aviation were contracted to build it and reaction motors were given the job of delivering the engine. It was designed to be drop launched from a B-52 at around 44,000 feet and then the rocket motor would push it up to 300,000 feet depending on the mission for around 80 to 120 seconds and then they would glide down and land on a dry lake bed. The first flight was on the 8th of June 1949 and the last of 199 flights was completed in 1968 and flown by multiple pilots including Neil Armstrong who went on to be the first person to walk on the moon. It's worth noting that you'll have seen two different versions, one with this more aerodynamic profile and then the faster one with this large attached auxiliary fuel tanks. It carried an extra 1,800 gallons of fuel allowing for 60 seconds of additional burn time. Obviously these would create more drag, but they would also allow the engines to operate longer, hence the higher speeds. Now it wasn't aerodynamic drag that was the rate limiting factor with the top speed, but instead it simply ran out of fuel while it was still accelerating. Three of these were built, with the third being destroyed in 1967. The first one is intact, but being restored at the Stephen F. Udvar-Hazy Center at Dallas Airport, and the second one, which is this one, is on display at the National Museum of the USAF in Dayton, Ohio. And speaking of them, a massive thanks to them for letting me film this aircraft up close. It's a brilliant place and well worth a visit, and I have many videos on my channel including the XB-70, the F-22, and the B-2 Spirit. First up, you'll notice a fairly blunt nose. The more rounded design, rather than the usual idea of having a pointed sharp nose like the SR-71, was to reduce drag. The idea was that it would create a bow shockwave that would create a boundary layer of air that would keep the extremely frictional heat away from the aircraft surface and reduce the overall drag. This idea was also used with success on the Space Shuttle Orbiter. The circular silver device is called a cue ball which had a number of small holes in it and this measured dynamic air pressure, calculating things like the angle of attack and side slip. This technology was used at the very top of the Saturn V rocket. This information would usually be obtained from probes on the aircraft surface, but the extreme heat would destroy them. Here's images of this actual aircraft after the Mach 6.7 flight and you can see the antenna underneath has been burned although the cue ball appears unaffected. These circles above and laterally are the rocket thrusters from the reaction control system. This flew up to 354,000 feet which technically is space and there's no directional control from the usual aerodynamic surfaces because there's no air pressure nor propulsion once the engines had used the fuel so the aircraft is controlled using these thrusters using a hydrogen peroxide monopropellant. Here's what these boosters look like from inside. The information obtained from these was then used on the Spatial Orbiter and other NASA space vehicles. Here's the nose landing gear which had no steering control to save weight and complexity as it was landing on a wide dry lake bed anyway so it wasn't really needed. You'll see there's no rear landing gear and I'll explain why when we get around to there. Up here in front of the windscreen is the pitot tube used to calculate the aircraft speed and you'll see it's far more sturdy than regular pitot tubes and that's because of the high temperature and speed it had to survive. Here's the cockpit which I was really excited to see inside of as most museums have the canopies closed. It's a unique design due to the multiple different controls and here's a photo of the first X-15 as the museum one has a few components removed. In the center is a regular control stick, but at extreme speeds, the G-force would make it impossible for the pilot to be strong enough to move this. Therefore, the controls were replicated with a much smaller control stick on the side, and this required much smaller inputs. On the left and next to the rocket motor throttles was the control stick for the reaction control system. 
Remember, they had nose mounted boosters to provide pitch and yaw control, while wing mounted boosters provided roll control. Here we are back in this one, and you'll see that the reaction control stick has been removed, as has part of the smaller control stick as well. Now it is very cool seeing a Mac counter go up to Mac 8. Now we'll spin around and look at the ejector seat which was designed to operate up to Mach 4 and 120,000 feet. These extra numbers required a far more advanced system and while a capsule was considered similar to what we see with the B-58 Hustler, it would have been far too heavy and complicated. You can see these stabilizing fins here and they would be deployed automatically as you can see in this test photo. Controlling the tumble was important to help stabilize the seat and keep the pilot conscious. There's two telescopic booms here that would also provide some stabilization. Pulling on the ejection handle would cause these armrests and thigh restraints to tighten inwards. The pilot would move their feet back and that would lock those in place. And this was all designed to stop the pilot's limbs from flailing about at such high speeds as they would otherwise likely break some bones. The seat also had onboard oxygen tanks to keep the pilot conscious until they were low enough where they could breathe with atmospheric pressure. Another consideration was the extremely cold temperatures at such high altitudes, so the pilots would have a battery kick in and provide heat to keep their visor clear of ice. It was automated, but there was a manual release if there was a failure, but below 15,000 feet, the pilot would be separated from the seat and all of its restraints, allowing them to parachute safely down with another parachute and land on their own two feet. Above them, this red thing was a forward headrest designed to keep the helmet from moving forward too much during dramatic deceleration once the engine had turned off. The windows were made of two separate half inch layers of quartz with vented air between them keeping the inner one down to a nice and cool 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Looking at this photo, you'll notice a small oval window, but back on the museum's X-15, you'll see these shutters and they're only on the left or port side of the aircraft. The reason for this was that the whole aircraft would be painted in an ablative surface over the standard skin, and this would be burned off by the aerodynamic heat. Here's the pink undercoat, and there would be a white coat over the top of that. The problem was that this material would then partially burn and streak along the aircraft surface and potentially obscure the windscreen. So they would keep this door closed until the high speed part of the flight was over and then open it to ensure that at least one window was open and clear for the landing approach. By the way, here's a photo of what it would look like with the canopy closed. Now immediately behind the cockpit were these massive fuel tanks and a surprisingly small rocket engine which we'll look at on the other side. Here's a cutaway diagram from NASA. There's a nitrogen tank, as this was used to pressurize the pilot suits, cooling and the cockpit. Helium gas was used to purge the cockpit as well. A forward hydrogen peroxide tank was used to power the two auxiliary power units which supplied energy for the hydraulic and electrical systems. And by the way, they had to wear these suits during refueling because it was so dangerous to touch. Then there's these massive tanks for the anhydrous ammonia and liquid oxygen followed by a smaller hydrogen peroxide tank at the rear which drove the high speed turbo pump sending the fuel into the rocket engine. What you didn't see on the cutaway diagram were these two additional fuel tanks, which, as I mentioned earlier, would create more drag, but importantly, a lot more fuel and thus a higher top speed. Now at speed, the temperature of the aircraft surface could reach 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is far more than the SR-71 and the titanium just wouldn't survive. It also had to manage extremely cold temperatures as the liquid oxygen had to be stored well below minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, if you look at this X-15 here below a B-52, you can see a white frost underneath where the tanks were. They used a nickel chrome alloy called Inconel X, which wouldn't melt, but would still expand at high temperatures. In fact, you can see multiple large panel gaps here that were intentionally designed to allow for heat expansion. The wing itself was quite small and thin, so it didn't create much resistance, thus allowing the highest speeds, but it also didn't provide much control. This wasn't a huge problem because in many ways, this was just a rocket powered missile and the wing's primary use would have been to help control the glider down to land. These small holes are rocket boosters from the reaction control system that we saw at the nose and this provides roll control at extremely high altitudes where, again, there was no wind passing over the regular surfaces to provide directional control. 
Up here you've got this single vertical stabiliser, but as the X-15 re-entered the atmosphere at a higher angle of attack, which has the nose anchored upwards to help wash off speed, but the nose and body would then end up shielding the horizontal stabiliser from any airflow, rendering it somewhat useless. So they had to install larger underside or ventral fins to maintain your stability. But the landing gear skids did not extend beyond this, so the lower part of this was actually jettisoned just before landing. Here's a photo of the ventral fin intact in flight, and it's almost as large as the dorsal fin. It's also noticeably thicker than most other vertical stabilizers or fins, and that was because it was found to be more stable at hypersonic speed, but it did create a lot more drag. In fact, the rear end produced as much drag as an entire F-104 Starfighter. Here's the horizontal stabilizer, and they found it was more stable if it was angled slightly downwards. Interestingly, looking from above, it's not much more than the main wings. You can also make out the wedge shape of the fin with this image as well, and that blunt end. Again, it would create a lot more drag than a regular tail fin, but this was found to create the greater stability. The lack of fuel rather than the aerodynamic drag was the primary speed limiter with the X-15. You'll notice that the ventral fin's lateral panels have been opened as these also acted as a speed brake. Remember that this fin would be double the size of what you see here, but the lower section has been removed from this display. These here are the propellant jettison pipes, as they would have to dump unburned fuel prior to landing, otherwise the airframe and landing skids may not be able to manage the additional weight. They initially used two Reaction Motors XLR11 liquid propellant rocket engines, which, by the way, is what the Bell X1 used, although only one of them, and this burned liquid oxygen and ethyl alcohol, which was extremely unstable, as the Germans discovered with their V2 rockets from World War II. They produced a combined 16,000 pounds of thrust, but were later replaced by the engine here, the single and considerably more powerful XLR99 rocket engine that produced up to 57,000 pounds of thrust and burned anhydrous ammonia instead, in addition to the liquid oxygen. You can actually see right into the combustion chamber where the propellants were sprayed in. This dome above was a helium tank which was used to pressurise the ammonia and essentially fill the space left when fuel was burned as helium itself is inert and won't react with much. Above that is a vertical stabiliser and the side panels would open laterally and act as a speed brake as you saw before. And on this side is more jettison pipes and the vent. This yellow set of wheels here is just for the display as there were no rear wheels which reduced complexity and weight. Remember that the entire middle and rear of the X-15 was just fuel tanks and a rocket engine, so a proper folding landing gear would have taken up a lot of space. Here's a photo of those skids that would deploy just before landing. Now it was launched from a B-52 already at around 45,000 feet, so it didn't need wheels for the takeoff either. Here are those extra fuel tanks again, and now let's look at the XLR-99 in a little more detail. As you can see, it's really not that large. The liquid ammonia enters here, and the liquid oxygen enters via this pipe, and you can see them flow into a turbine, which itself is powered by hydrogen peroxide, and this has to be powerful enough to spurt the fuel into the chamber at over 8,000 pounds or 4 tonnes per minute. This pipe here is a turbine exhaust, and you can see that exit just next to the main nozzle. In here you have the main chamber, which I'll show you inside shortly, and then the nozzle or the cone. You'll notice these lines or ridges in the nozzle, and that's because they're hollow and the ammonia flows through there, acting as a heat sink and stop it from melting. This is called regenerative cooling, and the cold ammonia was piped around the other hot parts of the rocket to reduce their temperature as well. In the very middle is the igniter and those circles around it are where the oxygen sprays out, and further around is the liquid ammonia. The oxygen being in the centre means that it's hottest there, and slightly reduces the temperatures exposed to the chamber walls. These were used for many other tests, including this white section, which was insulation to be used in a future Saturn V mission. And here it was exposed to hypersonic speed and heating. Here is a KS-25 reconnaissance camera underneath the fuselage, and here is a star tracker, which was used to photograph stars from 249,000 feet while flying at Mach 5. 
Information learned from this was vital for the development of cruise missiles and other aircraft such as the SR-71. On flight number 188, on October 3, 1967, William J. Knight took this very aircraft to a record setting 4,520 mph, which is 7,270 km an hour, or Mach 6.7. To put that into perspective, at that speed, it would take just 33 minutes to fly from New York City to Los Angeles. This held the crewed winged space plane speed record until passed by the Space Shuttle Orbiter Columbia in 1981. But it still holds the record for a non-orbital aircraft in the atmosphere under a powered and manned flight. Two flights, number 90 and 91, exceeded the 100 km or 62 mile altitude that denotes the Kármán line, which is where the Earth's atmosphere officially ends and space begins, and the highest was 67.1 miles or 354,288 feet. All of the pilots who flew above the Kármán line were officially recognised as astronauts. As mentioned earlier, number 3 was destroyed on the 15th of November 1967 and sadly pilot Michael J. Adams was killed. It entered a hypersonic spin while descending, exposing the aircraft to 15G vertically and 8G laterally, resulting in the airframe tearing apart at around 60,000 feet. This aircraft, number 2, was rebuilt after a crash landing in the 9th of November 1962. It was renamed the X-15A2 and had a longer fuselage to carry hydrogen for a test ramjet that didn't end up being used, and the larger auxiliary fuel tanks were added, and the heat-resistant ablative coating was added as well. The final flight was in 1968 when the program was cancelled, and this aircraft was retired to this museum a year later. I have many more similar detailed tours on my channel around this museum and others including the Museum of Flight, the Air and Space Museum, Pima, Duxford and more coming. If you enjoyed it please give it a thumbs up and thanks for watching.